Y'all went from rambunctious to super quiet very quickly. I'm not ready yet. But, uh, well, welcome, um, and welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, I'm Sasha Meinrath, and I direct the Open Technology Initiative, which is sort of our think tank's tech and telecom arm. And I'm excited because I think the, the geek density of this room is probably the highest that we've ever had here at New America. And I was very worried that something as nerdy as browser certificates would not capture people's imagination, even though I see it as probably one of the key issues under, underlying a lot of today's trustable networking and commerce. Open Technology Initiative has long highlighted sort of the tech underlying many of the services and applications and devices that we use in our everyday lives. And quite honestly, when it comes to the internet, I think few technologies are as widely used uh, yet as little understood as browser certificates. And these technologies, you know, we place a hell of a lot of trust in them. We, you know, they're the very foundation in many ways for our 21st century economy. And they facilitate commerce and privacy and, and we secure much of our sensitive information when it goes out over our communications network utilizing these technologies. And I think it's really important that we both understand what they can do, what they can't do, some of the threats that are emerging around them. Interesting. <laughs> threats, yeah, I know. It's like, oh, the klaxons are ringing. Uh, but, uh, you know, to help explicate these uh, technologies, the technologies themselves, and to really look into what they are, what they can do, is a difficult task. And so I'm very glad, in fact, to be able to pass the buck uh, to Ed Felton and Stephen Schwartz, Schultz, sorry, uh, both, who are director and associate director, respectively, of the Princeton Center for Information Technology Policy, uh, for a quick overview to kick things off this morning. Now, following this overview, uh, we'll turn things over to White House Deputy CTO Andrew McLaughlin, uh, who will provide some thoughts from the front line in terms of what he's hearing and thinking about these days. <laughs> That's right. And then, and then we'll have a, a distinguished panel of folks that are going to come up here and give some further thoughts. We have Adam Langley from Google, uh, Scott Rhea from uh, DigiCert, and Peter Eckersley from Electronic Frontier Foundation. And to respond to this panel and provide some sort of maybe overview thoughts on this, we have Ari Schwartz from NIST and Andy uh, Steingrubel from PayPal, who will provide sort of some additional, uh, I think, perspectives on this. And our aim is really very simple. We want to provide you uh, with ample opportunity to get your answers, your questions answered. We want to give you expertise in this area. And at the end of this morning's event, I think you will walk out, I think I can actually honestly say, you will walk out as some of the most knowledgeable people in D.C. on these issues. Low bar, I know. <laughs> so I hope that you will leave here with a great grasp of these technologies. I expect that you will understand why they're important, uh, why their emerging threats around these issues are so important, and why, as we move towards an increasingly online culture and global economy, this kind of uber geeky issue is really going to become more and more important and may even rise to the point where some of our key decision makers really take this seriously and make the changes and reforms that are necessary to protect online security and privacy. So let me turn this over now to your co-hosts, uh, two of the key experts, I think, in this space, Ed Felton and Stephen Schultz. Uh, morning. Good morning. I'm Ed Felton from uh, Princeton University, and uh, I'm the director of the Center for Information Technology Policy there. And my mission this morning is to give you a, uh, uh, a gentle technical tutorial on the technology that we're talking about here. Okay. So suppose I open up my browser window and I type in the address HTTPS www.princeton.edu. Um, all right. There we go. Um, and, and if I do this in uh, Internet Explorer, I see the top of my browser window looks like this. And of course, there are two hints to me as the user that I'm getting a secure connection. There's the S at the end of HTTPS saying that I'm using the secure version of the HTTP protocol. And there's the lock here. Similarly, if I go to uh, PayPal.com, I'll see this. Uh, pretty similar. I have an HTTPS here. Uh, I have the lock, and I have here two additional indicators. The address bar is turned green, 
and the true name of PayPal Incorporated appears here. And I'll talk later about why these are different. But the key idea here is that the user is getting an indication here that they have a secure connection to those particular websites. Now, really what we're here to talk about today is what does it mean to have a secure connection and how do we know, how does the user know what mechanisms are in place both technically and procedurally to make sure that uh, that promise is kept. So first of all, what is the promise? Um, if I'm here at Princeton.edu, uh, this lock means, the secure connection means basically two things. First of all, it means that I have encryption technologies in place which give me a protected channel to some server on the net. And second, that I have an authentication of the server's identity, that I know that the server at the other end of that secure connection is Princeton www.princeton.edu. Now, the first guarantee by itself of having a protected channel to somebody is not actually worth that much. Because if I have a protected channel to some criminal or imposter, I'm in big trouble. So the second uh, guarantee here of authenticating the server's identity is both more important and also more difficult to do. Uh, and so that's where our focus is going to be. How is it that my browser in this scenario uh, is able to verify that I'm really talking to Princeton University? Okay. So uh, how does it work? Well, there's a bunch of fancy math involved. Um, some of you in the front row may uh, be looking for errors in this equation or saying, well, this follows trivially from Euler's theorem. But um, most of you don't want to see this, so let's talk in terms of an analogy. Okay, so fundamentally, um, the online identity of a server is something which is distinctive but anonymous. You can think of it as being like a fingerprint, right? Like this particular pattern of black and white uh, swirls and, and lines, it is distinctive in that um, my fingerprint looks different from anyone else's. But it's not inherently identifying. That is, if you see this, uh, this particular fingerprint, it doesn't by itself tell you who it is. It might let you recognize this is the same person I saw before, but it doesn't tell you who it is. And you need something, some other mechanism in place on the side to know uh, who that fingerprint belongs to. Now, if you're a geek, what I'm uh, if, you're a, if you're a security geek, what I'm talking about here when I say fingerprint, you can think public key. Uh, in the jargon, this is called a public key or a public key fingerprint, but I'm going to talk about it as being like a fingerprint, I, uh, distinctive but not inherently identifying. Okay. So um, there, is a, there is a technical mechanism called the digital signature, which essentially lets you put a, a stamp some document, some piece of information with your fingerprint. And I'll portray that here in my diagrams with a little fingerprint mark down in the corner. You can think that there's, think, you can imagine there's a sort of signature box here, and somebody can endorse that document by literally putting their fingerprint mark on it. That's a digital signature. And so I'll use this imagery going forward. Okay, so um, when I go to uh, https www.princeton.edu and my browser is displaying the lock, um, you can imagine that that the connection that I have made to that server, and remember, I'm not sure yet who it is, I hope it's Princeton.edu, that that connection is signed or stamped with a particular fingerprint. So uh, because of the way the underlying technology works, I know the fingerprint of the party who's on the other end. And I can verify that that fingerprint does belong to the party who's on the other end. And this now leaves me with the problem of whose fingerprint is that? I hope it's Princeton.edu's fingerprint, but I need to actually verify that. I need some technology, I need some process that lets me figure that out. Okay, so we've drilled down now kind of to the hardcore of the problem is how do you know which fingerprint, which public key in the, in the jargon uh, belongs to which entity? Okay, now uh, the way that you tend to do that is by using another kind of document. Uh, which is called a certificate, a digital certificate, sometimes uh, called a cert for short. And what a cert or certificate is, is essentially a document in which somebody vouches for somebody else's fingerprint. So you have a statement that Princeton.edu's fingerprint looks like this, and that statement is signed by somebody else. In this uh, slide, it's the blue and yellow um, fingerprint. Okay, so some authority is vouching for the, the connection between this fingerprint and the organization 
Princeton.edu. And CERT's digital certificates are a big part of the technical infrastructure we're talking about. Okay, so now, if I put these two things together, I have a web page which is vouched for by this fingerprint, and I have a CERT that says that Princeton.edu's fingerprint is the same, and I can just look at these two images and say, yeah, that's the same fingerprint. So I know that this CERT is talking about whoever it was who uh, is who's on the other end of this connection providing this web page. Um, and of course, this cert is signed by this party. So if I believe that this party is telling me the truth in this cert, then I can have confidence that this page really did come from Princeton.edu. My reasoning being that this party is telling me the truth, therefore this is Princeton.edu's fingerprint, and Princeton.edu is the one who provided me this page. And that's kind of the chain of reasoning that I need to go through. And there's a bunch of fancy cryptographic math which is happening behind the scenes to allow me to connect these dots to verify that um, these things really came from the people who signed them and all of that. Okay, so this introduces the role of the certificate authority. A certificate authority is the party who signs or puts their fingerprint signature onto a certificate. And uh, in my images so far, it's been this blue and yellow fingerprint is acting as a certificate authority. Uh, this is a party who's in the business of providing certificates. Okay, so a certificate authority issues and signs certificates, and uh, they ought to be doing it based on some due diligence. That is, if some um, random person calls up the certificate authority and says, I, uh, I'm Princeton.edu, here's my fingerprint, please make me a certificate, they ought to, they ought, they ought, the certificate authority ought to be doing some checking. So the certificate authority, or CA, is going to be doing some amount of due diligence to verify that they're really dealing with the actual Princeton.edu. And uh, if, the, if they're happy, then they will issue and sign a certificate. Okay. So here's the certificate authority's uh, fingerprint or, or public key. Um, now, of course, I have the question, is that really the CA's fingerprint? So I may have decided that I'm going to trust a particular certificate authority. Um, and I have a certificate that is supposed to be signed by that certificate authority, but how do I know that that uh, fingerprint really belongs to the certificate authority that I wanted? Well, I could say I need, some, I need a meta certificate authority who will give me a meta certificate um, vouching that this really is the certificate authority I think it is, but then how do I know about the meta certificate authority's fingerprint? I could go meta meta, but I'm, uh, that, that's not going to get me to a solution. What I need to do, and, and so the other question I need to ask, of course, is not just is that really the certificate authority's fingerprint, also do I actually trust that certificate authority to have done their due diligence correctly and to be honest in, uh, in, giving, me, um, in giving me the answer that they know is correct in issuing the certificate. Okay, now, uh, and Steve, uh, Steve Schultz, who will do the policy tutorial in a few minutes, is going to talk about uh, at least the second issue of do I trust the certificate authority? How do I know which certificate authorities I should trust? But as to the first question, how do I know really what is the certificate authority's fingerprint? Um, the answer is uh, essentially wired into my browser. Uh, when my browser comes from the manufacturer, it has a list of certificate authorities and for each one of those certificate authorities, a fingerprint. And those are wired into my browser and my browser is programmed to accept certificates that come from any of those certificate authorities. How many of those are there? Well, uh, depends on which browser you have, but there might be 100, there might be 200. If um, um, in, um, with Internet Explorer on Windows, there is a dialog box deep in the user interface. If you sort of dig down into those security dialog boxes that, uh, let's face it, none of us uh, really ever open, uh, one of them is this one, which lists all of the certificates that um, are all the certificate authorities, trusted root certification authorities, which are trusted by, um, which are built into my browser and which are trusted by default. And um, you can see that I would have to scroll a lot to see them all. This uh, just goes in the alphabet from AAA up through AC. Uh, there are a lot of them. There are more than 200 um, in this particular system. And they're from all over the world. The last one here, ACNLB, uh, is a bank in Slovenia. Um, and um, you can see these are from all over the world, um, and 
I, as a user, don't necessarily have any kind of institutional uh, relationship or um, inherent reason to trust all of these parties. Nonetheless, there is a process operating which causes uh, all of these parties to have the power, the technical power, to issue certificates which my browser will accept. Okay. Um, now, um, so what that means is that if any one of these 200 or so parties says that uh, Sasha is really Google.com, then my browser will believe that Sasha is Google.com, and Sasha's already um, scheming uh, of what he, could, what he could do with that. Uh, so any of these has the power to issue a certificate which my browser will believe. And therefore, any of these has the power to uh, put an identity label on any party which my browser will believe, and which my, will cause my browser to show uh, the lock. And, uh, and tell me that I have a secure connection to that place. Uh, but there's even another mechanism that, uh, that, that is uh, available, and that is that it exists, and that is a delegation. There's a kind of certificate called a de which we'll call a delegation certificate, which essentially allows any one of these, um, uh, any one of these trusted certificate authorities to delegate their certifying power to someone else. It's a kind of special certificate that says, treat this print fingerprint here as if it were my own, signed by the certificate authority. So any certificate authority, not only are there 200 and some certificate authorities that are built into my browser, but any one of them can, tr can delegate uh, that, uh, that trust status to anyone else that they want, simply by uh, creating a certain string of bits which they, uh, which they make available. Okay. So... That's a quick tour through the technology. Um, but just to back up and review, what the user sees is this simple scenario with um, a browser bar that says HTTPS and a lock. Uh, and I've shown you here, two, here actually two different kinds of, um, of secure connections that uh, come from different kinds of, 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 of certificates. On the top, we have what's called the domain validation certificate. And on the bottom, we have what's called an extended validation certificate. Um, and the differences between them uh, are, are two things. Well, first of all, um, uh, the user can tell the difference, partly because in the extended validation, the uh, address bar turns green. Different browsers do this in different ways, but something lights up green up here at the top of the page. Uh, and second, that the true name, uh, that is not the, the name PayPal.com, but the actual name PayPal Incorporated, United States, uh, shows up here with an extended validation cert. The other difference is that the... Uh, with an extended validation cert, the um, certificate authority has done more due diligence or is supposed to have done more due diligence before issuing the certificate. And so there are reasons to believe that an extended validation cert may be um, more trustworthy. But ultimately, all the user sees is the HTTPS, the green, uh, the lock, and possibly the name. And all the technical mechanism that I talked about and all of the administrative mechanism that Steve is about to talk about are happening behind the scenes, and those had better work correctly if users are to trust uh, what's actually going on. So now let me pass the baton to Steve Schultz, my colleague, who's going to talk about the process that uh, goes on uh, in order for uh, CAs to issue certificates. Great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, and uh, as Ed mentioned, uh, I work with him at the Center for Information Technology Policy. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the process that goes on uh, between the different stakeholders in this space in order to make the system work, uh, and then talk a little bit about some potential problems with how it works and places where there might be reasonable policy interventions. So the stakeholders in this, spe this space, roughly speaking, are the browsers and operating system vendors, which make the types of decisions Ed was just describing, uh, which certificate authorities get admitted into the browsers, uh, and in some cases those standards are slightly different for regular old CAs and uh, extended validation CAs. Uh, the certificate authorities themselves, who have their own internal policies uh, and are required to define those policies publicly, uh, Websites, which in the language, the legal language of, uh, cert of certif the certificate authority scheme are called subscribers, uh, which is not an entirely obvious label, but if you ever go into the, the details of some of this documentation, you see reference to subscribers. They're talking about websites. Uh, and end users uh, who are called relying parties. 
So in the browser and OS vendor space, we have uh, the standard desktop uh, browsers and OS vendors. Mozilla is really the only browser, the only major browser that maintains its own list of certificate authorities. Uh, all of the other browsers really default to what the operating system uh, delivers along with the operating system. So the power of uh, Microsoft and Apple in this space uh, is very substantial and they have their own policies and procedures for deciding who gets included in those lists. But becoming increasingly important uh, uh, is the mobile market where uh, vendors there likewise have to make decisions about which certificate authorities they include. Uh, and often these interfaces are even uh, harder to find or more unknown than in the desktop environment. And as we do more through our phones, we're doing more uh, securely through our phones and rely on those lists. Certificate authorities, well, Ed, as Ed mentioned, there are quite a few. This is just a sampling of a few of them. Uh, it's everything from the big guys like VeriSign, who just sold off their certificate authority business to Symantec, uh, to uh, up-and-comers like Digicert, who we'll hear from later today, uh, to folks like Startcom, uh, which is a guy named Eddie who lives in Israel. Uh, uh, and in fact, I would, I would note that out of all of these uh, uh, Eddie would be one of my most trusted certificate authorities because, in fact, I've actually emailed with the guy and I have a good relationship with him and a reasonable amount of trust. Uh, I have no personal connection with VeriSign, Symantec, Komodo, or the like. Uh, an, uh, another set of certificate authorities listed here are governmental or quasi-governmental certificate authorities. So um, uh, we have, for example, uh, the Chinese Network Information Center, um, and then uh, representatives from the UAE uh, and the Turkish government as well. Now, uh, on the bottom I've included a couple of examples of private certificate authorities. Uh, in this case, uh, the US federal government and a, a bridge certificate authority, which is a, a group of certificate authorities that have gotten together to work privately called Bio, Safe Biopharma. Um, these are not included in your public browser and these are sort of private uh, systems of certificate authorities that have come together around a shared need to communicate with each other. And I assume that in the panel we'll get into some more detail there. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe billions of sites uh, using SSL. Actually, I think some people in the audience have stats on that. It may only be millions. Um, uh, but from every, every domain of your public life, uh, uh, the U.S. government, your health care, your email, uh, your banking and the like all use this system. And you are the relying parties. So uh, how does this all work and how do these entities re uh, relate to each other? It's essentially a chain of trust. And, uh, and the browser and OS vendor sits at the top. They get to make decisions about whether or not certificate authorities are included in the trusted list. Uh, and once a certificate authority is approved in the trusted list, uh, sites come to them and say, hey, I'm Princeton.edu or I'm Google.com. Do you believe who I really am? Uh, who, who, I really am who I say I am? If the certificate authority thinks that yes, they are, then they grant them a certificate. And sites begin to present those to end users when end users request secure pages. Now, the only way that, as Ed noted, that end users know to trust these answers that they're getting and that they're really talking to the real person is that they've gotten a list of these uh, trusted certificates in their browser up front. Um, so hence, their browser comes with a built-in certificate list. So the question is, why should users trust the system? Well, there are a couple reasons. They could either know the CA, so I will trust Eddie because I know Eddie, but you may not know Eddie. Uh, in fact, most users won't know any certificate authorities, in which case they have to be able to believe that the overall process is trustworthy. So, at what points in this chain of trust are policy decisions uh, involved and uh, are policy interventions possible? Well, uh, there are policy decisions being made by the browser and OS vendor about uh, what constitutes a good reason to include a certificate authority. There are, there are policy decisions being made uh, by certificate authorities about what constitutes due diligence for checking sites. And there's an implicit policy decision being made by end users when they download a browser that has a particular root certificate list. So let's, let's look in a little bit more detail at each of these uh, and where, in, in where specifically these policies are defined. So I'll talk briefly about uh, auditor schemes, which 
uh, apply to certificate authorities such that every certificate authority typically before being included in a browser needs to be audited according to a standard system. Uh, every certificate authority needs to define a public set of policies about how they operate and publish those and give those to browsers beforehand. Uh, the browsers uh, and operating system vendors may have additional requirements above and beyond auditing, and in many cases they do. Uh, and then there is also a role for standards bodies. Uh, sometimes these are technical decisions that standards bodies make which influence the policy decisions that are possible, the range of possible uh, policy solutions, um, uh, and affect the process in other ways. So very briefly, uh, auditor standards uh, include the, the most widely known one, which is called Web Trust, which was a standard developed. Maybe some folks uh, on our panel can talk a little bit about the history of, uh, of Web Trust, but it was developed uh, 10 plus years ago, uh, developed uh, by CPAs and requires a, a CPA in order to, to do the audit. You may ask, why are CPAs the most qualified people to be doing these audits? And I would ask the same question. Um, uh, and then there are a couple of other standards which browsers will often accept. Uh, and in those cases, uh, uh, you need not be a CPA, but you need to follow these particular guidelines. Um, and uh, there's an important body called the CA Browser Forum, which is a group of certificate authorities, browser vendors, and some other uh, relevant parties uh, who discuss standards, especially around extended validation. Uh, although they are now actually taking a look at whether or not there should be baseline requirements for uh, non-extended validation certs as well. Uh, if you want to find out what certificate authorities are doing and what their standards are, they have to publish something called a certification practice statement, which explains how they create their keys, their requirements for vetting people who ask them for certificates and the like. Um, uh, a certificate policy, which is a broader policy document, and a subscriber agreement, which purports to bind their relationship between them and their sites, often actually uh, disclaiming li any liability that the certificate authority uh, has in the process, which in and of itself is interesting. Uh, so the browser OS policies include things like, and this is the Mozilla certificate policy, which is the most public uh, uh, of all of these processes. Mozilla does a lot of this uh, approval process in public, and if you want to, you can participate as well. Um, uh, their uh, OS policy, or their, their um, CA policy includes things like uh, CAs may not, will not be accepted if they knowingly issue certificates without the knowledge of the entities whose information is referenced, uh, or knowingly issue certificates known to be fraudulent. They also require that uh, for regular old SSL certificates, uh, uh, you get audited by Web Trust, and for EV uh, 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 CAs, you get audited by the uh, appropriate EV auditing process. And then they talk about who constitutes a competent party, especially for non Web Trust audits. It's important to know that your auditor is competent, uh, and they have criteria like, uh, uh, let's see, my bullets disappeared, but. Uh, so the party must have knowledge of CA-related technical standards, uh, experience performing audits, and be honest and objective. And I guess Mozilla gets to decide who's honest and objective in this context. Uh, standards bodies uh, pr uh, provide an Im important role in this process as well. Uh, groups like the IETF that define the actual technical standards for things like public key infrastructure uh, or for uh, DNSSEC. Uh, or for uh, 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 trust anchor management, uh, or for requiring uh, always connecting uh, in a secure manner, uh, are important in that they help to define the range of uh, options that players in this field can require or be required to require. Uh, groups like ICANN may become increasingly important to the extent that any of this moves into the domain name system. Uh, and NIST is uh, frequently helpful in terms of po uh, publishing best practices uh, and explanatory materials uh, about how the different standards work. So in answer to the question, why should the user trust the process, uh, the, the user may answer, uh, well, I know that uh, when my browser accepts a certificate authority that they're requiring an audit. So is because an auditor said so a good reason uh, to trust that 
uh, something was rightfully included. Uh, or uh, when a certificate authority is granting a certificate, is it a good enough reason to say, well, the certificate authority sent an email to someone at the domain in question, they received it and clicked on a link. That's good enough to prove that that person, in fact, controls that domain name. So this is the most complicated slide I'll show today. Uh, but incorporating the iconography from uh, Ed's presentation, this is where the uh, fingerprints end up falling in the flow diagram. So the certificate authority has that blue fingerprint, as uh, Ed explained. Um, and what I've done here is, is added uh, the red fingerprints. Those are the delegation certificates. So uh, any given certificate authority may make policy decisions. This little, little green box, they have many different policy decisions, and they're not all or even mostly well documented around who to give this godlike power to. Uh, and those people may give that power to other people and other people, depending on how uh, those certificates are constrained. Um, uh, eventually, the, uh, the certificate authority will sign a site's certificate, and that will make its way down to the end user. The end user then decides that, based on this library of certificate authorities that I trust that came along with my browser up here, uh, whether or not this is, in fact, a secure connection with someone who I can readily identify. So very briefly, some problems. First of all, we have this unconstrained delegation problem that both Ed and I have described. Uh, when a certificate authority delegates power to a third party, they essentially give their full godlike power to create uh, certificates for any site uh, to this third party. And often this is happening without the knowledge of the end user, without any documentation, and without any means of preventing it uh, on the browser side. Uh, so you essentially have the potential for these submarine certificates uh, to appear without knowledge to end users. And in fact, they may have been created years earlier, uh, and whoever wants to make use of them can make use of them uh, at some point down the line. Uh, and uh, so I stole a diagram from Pete Eckersley, who will be up here talking soon. This is an attempt. So, so uh, uh, Peter mapped out the SSL space and uh, the delegated certificates out there and attempted to graph it. And it's impossible to put on a PowerPoint slide because there are simply so many of these entities and they're interrelated in so many ways. So this is half of the diagram and you can't really see it, but of course there are hundreds and hundreds of such entities which delegate to each other in different ways. Um, and the only way that uh, Peter even knows this much is because he spent a bunch of time crawling the internet. There is no public documentation of this. Uh, that's the top half of the graph. And then this is the bottom half of the graph. And then there's a bunch of stuff that doesn't fit <laughs> anywhere uh, on a PowerPoint slide. So another problem is that there's no excludability. And I've hinted at this uh, already. There's no way for a site owner to say, uh, if someone goes to bad shady certificate authority and gets a certificate that claims that they are me, don't trust that person. I'm only ever going to use good reputation certificate authority. Uh, what this means is that there's a real weakest link problem where anyone in the system, uh, any bad CA in the system, uh, is essentially the highest bar of security. Uh, and uh, this essentially builds on what I was saying. So there are hundreds of CAs out there. If you can essentially go to whichever CA uh, will give you a certificate, uh, if you give it them enough money or if you're politically aligned with them, uh, then the, the security of the whole system uh, lowers down to that level. Uh, perfect audits aren't enough. I mentioned that audits uh, only cover a certain subset of things. Um, in fact, they don't include thir third parties like the subordinate delegated certificate authorities. So those, are, those entities are not required to be audited. Uh, and I haven't mentioned this entity before, but there are these groups called, these, these companies called uh, reselling authorities which essentially do the due diligence on behalf of the certificate authorities, then tell the certificate authorities, okay, we did the due diligence, you can trust what we say, issue the certificate now. They're essentially acting like a subordinate certificate authority without having access to some of the key cryptographic material underneath. Um, and in some cases, there are certificate authorities with hundreds such uh, reselling authorities. Uh, and if the security of just one of those 
uh, is compromised, they can essentially do anything they want within the system. There are some uh, bad economic incentives, such as uh, uh, as soon as one certificate authority uh, uh, decides to uh, lower their prices and lower their due diligence, uh, all other certificate authorities are pushed economically towards that path. So as soon as, because as an end user, I can't, I don't really tell the difference between a certificate that came from a AAA rated uh, CA and uh, D rated CA, uh, all certificate authorities will begin to be forced to try to offer certificates at the price of D rated uh, certs rather than the AAAs. Uh, another problem is that practically speaking, vendors these are browser and operating system vendors, don't drop CAs from their list for bad behavior. Uh, to my knowledge, it has never happened. Uh, the only uh, certificates that I've ever, C CAs that I've ever seen dropped from lists uh, have been related to, uh, for example, certificate authorities that were added a long time ago and no one can contact them anymore, or uh, keys that say that they're from a particular certificate authority, but when contacted, the certificate authority has no knowledge of where those keys came from. Um, now, these are typically things that happened uh, longer ago. Uh, 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 for the most part, our practice, the practices of the, the vendors has improved since that time, but it's a bit troubling that those existed in the first place. Uh, and more importantly, the vendors don't have, the only thing the vendors have is a big stick. The big stick being remove you completely from the list. They have no little stick to, pe to penalize you, put you on probation, uh, somehow shame you into doing the right thing. And so the bar is very high for getting any kind of retribution. Uh, uh, so very rarely will you be kicked off that list. CAs are instead incentivized to not quite do as much as they should, um, but uh, with the knowledge that they're probably not going to kick get kicked off. Uh, related is this notion that vendors will not uh, judge trustworthiness. They don't want to be put in that position uh, morally or uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, judging ambiguities in the system. Uh, ideally, they want ha to have very clearly defined process and then judge whether or not you are following the process that you have defined to the extent that they can. Uh, so whereas what the block icon communicates to end users is you can trust this entity. The reality is what the vendors are saying is we have followed a particular process which we assume you are familiar with and to the extent of our knowledge they are following the process that they claim to be following. Uh, there are technical bad practices which I won't go into detail. This is a whole separate area. I stole these uh, from Peter's uh, DEF CON slides. Uh, these are examples of names uh, of sites that were, have been included in certificates. So, uh, Peter, what were there? Dozens of, or, or hundreds of these, these local network addresses as the name uh, of the entity, local host, um, RSA keys that are not long enough to actually be secure, and the CA false example. Uh, notably, actually, when we, we, were, we were noting uh, when we came in here, uh, this, the slide up front that was telling you how to log into Wi-Fi said, when you log in, you may get an invalid certificate. Uh, you should just click through and ignore it. Um, and although I would love to beat up on New America Foundation for that, the reality is that the technical solutions simply uh, don't exist or are very challenging uh, to do some of this stuff right. And that's why we end up seeing some of these goofy certificate behaviors uh, as well as negligence. <laughs> uh, Finally, jurisdiction is very complicated in this space. Certificate authorities exist in hundreds of jurisdictions worldwide. Users exist in every jurisdiction imaginable. Uh, choice of law is very complicated. The question of uh, what it means to follow the law uh, or to be diligent is very complicated. What do you do if your local law tells you that when the government comes to your door, you should issue them a certificate for uh, whatever site that they claim uh, they want uh, uh, is, and uh, what your users are saying is, well, I'm in a different jurisdiction and I am expecting you to issue certificates only for the true owners and controllers of sites. Um, uh, it's a very ambiguous question and uh, certificate authorities, browser vendors, and others are left uh, in a sort of middle space where they 
they have to break the law somewhere. Uh, uh, and if they do, it's complicated knowing what will in fact happen. But there is hope, uh, and this is where I'll, I'll end. Uh, first of all, there are not that many operating systems and browser vendors, so if we come up with good solutions, there are not many people that need to coordinate in order to get them done. Uh, patches to the existing system are possible, and some of the things we've talked about today uh, have technical uh, and policy improvements in the pipeline that can mitigate some of those problems. Um, and finally, there are some potential partial alternatives and augmentations to the system, which I'm sure our panel will get into. One such example, um, uh, and we'll debate the, the, the benefits and disadvantage of the, uh, disadvantages of these, but one such example is uh, putting keys into DNS and securing them through uh, the uh, DNS security extensions called uh, DNSSEC, uh, and that's a uh, geek rabbit hole, but an interesting alternative to explore. Uh, so I will remind everyone, I don't think we mentioned this up front, uh, the hashtag for the event is eThreats, so if you're tweeting this, uh, stick that on there. We were thinking about, um, did you already start using something else? No, no. Okay. We were thinking about using ET, and I looked, and it was uh, Entertainment Tonight, uh, and the last thing we wanted at this kind of event was some kind of hash collision. So, um, so in any case, it's eThreats. Good, geeks in the room, excellent. Um, all right, so uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, a man who needs no introduction, uh, Andrew McLaughlin, uh, Deputy CTO for the White House on Internet Policy. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for the invite. So uh, it's been mentioned already that uh, the fact that this many people are gathered in a room in Washington on a topic that is this geeky is something of note. Um, and I think that's true. I mean, we're all, you know, in some sense, uh, combatants in the age-old war of jocks versus nerds. And uh, I got to say, at the moment, I'm feeling like this may be the high watermark of nerddom <laughs> in our adult lives. It, this was the week of the Science and Technology Fair uh, at the White House, had a Science and Technology Fair, the geek quotient was extremely high. Uh, this weekend, there's a, a big science and technology fair out on the mall. Uh, if you've got nothing else going on, it is uh, definitely going to be the place to dork out. Um, and uh, anyway, so just in, in honor of that, I'm going to give uh, my presentation this morning in Klingon. <laughs> uh, so let me start off by, by outlining um, the attack scenario that has been kind of on the minds of people uh, in uh, in Washington, in Internet land, lately, and it's it's one that uh, has been the subject of uh, uh, exercises and uh, a lot of uh, sort of head scratching, um, and it directly relates to uh, or incorporates the problem that we're talking about today. And so that attack scenario is one where you want to bring down the internet, and the way to do that is to bring to bear a combination of techniques such as route leaking. This is when ISPs claim to be able to terminate particular IP address ranges uh, even when they cannot. Um, you combine that with DNS poisoning, which is uh, injecting uh, uh, entries into uh, DNS uh, uh, tables um, uh, throughout the Internet in order to um, give uh, inaccurate answers uh, when users are trying to resolve DNS queries. And then uh, on top of that, cert spoofing, uh, which is a way... Um, to affect man-in-the-middle type attacks where um, uh, you believe that you can trust the website that you're talking to, uh, but in fact uh, uh, should not. And uh, if we want to really have fun, then we layer on top of that a whole variety of targeted um, uh, botnet-driven DDoS attacks on particular bits of infrastructure. And you can put together a scenario where um, uh, the Internet you know, really grinds to a halt for all practical purposes for um, you know, significant periods of time. So that's the attack scenario. Um, and what's interesting is in each one of those, we are looking at um, a multi-jurisdictional, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, problem for which there is no governmental solution. Um, in other words, in each one of these attack vectors, in order to be able to address it, we have to make changes or, 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 or improvements in practice across many different players doing different functions with different sets of incentives in different countries subject to different uh, kinds of law. And so that's what makes this morning's discussion um, both timely and really fun, is that this is the classic uh, internet problem, the classic internet policy problem. 
Um, the internet is uh, a collection of voluntarily interconnected networks. Um, they are composed of vast diversities of uh, hardware um, that use vast diversities of um, administrative models and configuration techniques. Um, they use, um, uh, uh, and they support, by the way, uh, looking up uh, uh, the vast um, uh, universe of applications and services that we've all come to enjoy and love. But it is that diversity of players, jurisdictions, standards, hardware, um, uh, physical interconnection techniques, and so forth that makes the internet the awesome thing that it is. It's also what makes these problems that we're talking about this morning um, particularly hard to deal with. Um, and so uh, the three themes that I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned from the sort of public policy perspective are uh, uh, multi-stakeholder, multi-jurisdictional, and government won't fix. Um, and as I said, the multi-stakeholder uh, reality means that different players on this voluntarily, voluntarily interconnected collection of networks um, uh, can impose externalities on others. Uh, in other words, their insecure practices, because of the voluntary nature of the network, can uh, make the network insecure for other people who are um, actually doing the right things that they're supposed to do. So we have this externalities problem. Um, the multi-jurisdictional uh, um, theme is about the fact that, for example, certificate authorities are in countries. Um, they exist within, in some sense, uh, a bounded physical space that we call a nation state, and therefore they will be subject to um, uh, different laws and different uh, governmental regimes. Um, since in Washington we don't like to name names, we can paint a scenario where um, let's suppose the certificate authority is in, I don't know, Alderaan. Um, the uh, end user uh, is uh, on the one of the moons of Hoth. Um, the uh, 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 browser maker is uh, based on the third moon of Endor. And we all know that nothing good comes from Endor. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, and the uh, bank that our user in Alderaan wants to talk to is in Naboo. And again, I don't need to say anything about Naboo. Um, so anyway, so, so you've got your four players in a given banking transaction in four different places. And the reason this is important is because um, if the user uh, uh, and the bank that the user wants to talk to are in neighboring countries, but they're relying on a certificate authority in yet a third country, uh, and they are relying on that because of a decision made by a browser maker that's in yet a fourth country, um, uh, you can imagine that the room for mischief uh, if the uh, country of the certificate authority is devious or repressive or um, uh, in some way even participating in an attack on internet infrastructure elsewhere, um, you really face a real problem. You're making a trust decision when the political environment that uh, 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 governs one of those actors um, is going to produce it to be is going to cause it to be to produce bad behavior. So um, anyway, that's sort of the um, that that's the multi-jurisdictional problem. And then you know the last the theme that I wanted to uh, you know just ex be very explicit about is that um, because of the multi-jurisdictional and multi-stakeholder nature of the problem. Uh, government um, can't fix it and government shouldn't fix it. So this is not an area where public policy is going to be able to waltz in with a clever set of regulations um, or uh, uh, some kind of um, uh, rule set perpetrated down through the system by an authority. It's just not going to happen. Um, uh, I think uh, Sasha said that I was going to be speaking from the front lines. You know, the government's experience with front lines is like the Maginot line. You know, like you don't want government uh, to try to uh, to try to be your um, your front line. We have a history uh, of screwing things up, um, even if it were possible. There are good reasons for government not to try to dictate solutions here. Um, so, um, so then, so the problem in that sense is um, can be thought of as a multi uh, as a um, collective action problem. In other words. Multiple different players in this ecosystem have to act in concert um, in order to produce a better result. And um, what I mean by that is, you know, um, uh, certificate authorities can't alone uh, make their system airtight. They have to interact with their subscribers and they have to interact with browser makers. Same thing, you could say that about each of those three. Um, and the problem, in a sense, is how to get multiple and, and competing actors uh, in multiple countries. Uh, to act in the right way without uh, go a governmental requirement forcing them to do that. Um, 
one answer to that, by the way, is talking about it, like we're doing this morning, is one way to get people to focus on the problem and assuming, as I think we should, the fundamental goodwill um, and community-mindedness of most of the actors in this space, both for their own commercial reasons and for the broader health of the internet, um, talking about it intelligently is one way to do that. Um, and, uh, and then if we drill down a little bit more, you know, we can sort of try to analyze the problems that the different actors face. For example, if you're a browser maker, uh, how do you know what's a bad CA? Um, you know, they, 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 they do not, for very good reason, want to be in the business of making discretionary judgments about the trustworthiness or goodness or badness of particular sets of actors. They try to come up with process structures that act as proxies for that ultimate judgment. But so the question is, how would a browser maker know um, uh, who is uh, uh, a good certificate authority or not a good certificate authority? Um, uh, one way to answer that might be to come up with, um, with different um, more rigorous best practices against which to measure uh, the, the, the CAs that want to be default recognized in the browsers. Um, we might take a very close look, for example, at the problem of, uh, of delegated authority, which both uh, Ed and Stephen uh, talked about. Um, uh, we might be able to say you, should, you, you will get bounced out of the default list if you are delegating your authority to others that are not subject to, to the same uh, 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 requirements as the the root authority itself. Um, uh, and there may be a role for standards bodies, by the way, to help flesh out what the best practices ought to look like in order to come up with a better, uh, more secure ecosystem. Um, there's another problem, you know, or another sort of way to look at this, which is the incentives problem. In other words, um, what is the incentive that counteracts the race to the bottom? Um, where there's never any danger, these days at least, of getting kicked out of the default uh, set of recognized CAs, um, there is every reason for a CA to um, uh, make as much money as it can and spend as little as it needs to. And so that can lead to this sort of race to the bottom scenario where just about anybody can get a certificate somewhere um, and uh, uh, the practices which cost more and may make you less money um, um, uh, are not, you know, are, are, not, are, are not embraced. Um, one thing I do want to mention is um, uh, the potential for uh, DNSSEC uh, to play a role in this area. So um, one of the things that's notable about the, uh, the CA universe is that it's multi-root. So in other words, each CA is its own root, and that's why it's important that your browser default recognize it, uh, because it's basically defining the roots from which it will um, um, uh, accept and recognize certificates. The DNS is, is, uh, is different because it's single-rooted. Uh, the domain name system has a single root from which the um, translations of uh, names into IP addresses flows. And um, we've recently seen the DNS uh, graft onto its infrastructure um, a PKI architecture. Um, so now DNSSEC is a way to do a, 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 a cryptographic uh, check when you're getting a DNS response to know whether you're getting the one that you're supposed to be getting, whether you can trust the DNS response that you're getting from the DNS. And uh, what's interesting about that is that we now have, um, for the first time, a globally, um, a, 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 a single-rooted PKI of global scope and soon, I think, mass adoption, kind of up and down the internet um, uh, 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 ecosystem. And um, what's interesting about that is that when you've got a single-rooted, you know, uh, uh, a cryptographic uh, structure like that, um, that means that you could try to use that for things other than just um, uh, name to number resolution, and what's interesting ab and uh, uh, what's interesting about that is that the DNS um, spec is is such that it could in fact deliver keys or deliver other kinds of cryptographic payloads um, to users um, to associate names with uh, to associate uh, with their uh, domain names. Um, but um, this also has a problem embedded in it, which is that maybe one of the advantages of the CA universe is that it is in fact uh, multi-rooted rather than single-rooted. I mentioned this multiple attack scenario at the very beginning, and one of the problems with the, uh, getting everybody to rely on a single-rooted DNS tree for the you know, validity of all the transactions that they're uh, trying to engage in on the internet is that if you take that out, um, then you really are, um, to use the technical term, hosed. And so having multiple roots actually operating even in competition with each other, in tandem with each other, providing multiple paths of validation and verification might actually be a strength that you want to preserve, even if you could get um, more lockdown and reliable responses from, from a DNSSEC response. There is a, uh, an advantage in diversity. 
Um, so let me just close by saying uh, that you know if we if we step back a little bit and look a little bit beyond the CA problem, these same themes uh, replicate themselves in a couple of the other areas that I mentioned at the very beginning. One of the attack vectors that I noted was uh, um, uh, was uh, the um, uh, use of the routing system to hijack routes um, and to hijack traffic by hijacking routes. Um, there is a, uh, a way to deal with that, which is, again, cryptographic. It's something called RPKI or Registry PKI. This would be a way to say, okay, uh, ISP, you're announcing that you can terminate the following ranges of IP addresses. And um, what we're going to do is check that against the delegation tree that comes from the regional internet registry. They're going to uh, uh, be part of a, a, a rooted system by which we can uh, check the validity of your route announcements. Um, that again is something which may be a good idea. It's going to require full standardization through the IETF and then implementation by everybody who is running BGP or interconnecting or peering or buying transit or whatever. At every AS to AS point, you're going to have to um, uh, 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 validate the routes. And that again is a multi-stakeholder, multi-jurisdictional problem where government's not going to tell everybody to do it. It's going to happen because uh, it's going to have to happen because it makes sense. And then the final thing I want to note, though, is that um, uh, 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 at a very broad level, a lot of the things that we are talking about are essentially behavioral best practices that um, don't happen because of some combination of lack of incentives and uh, lack of clue and, uh, uh, and so forth. In other words, the ability of individual actors in this voluntarily interconnected network to impose externalities on others in order to keep their own costs or irritation levels low. Um, this is a, a, a this is a recurring theme. Um, every ISP, for example, should be using BGP thirty eight ingress filtering. There are IP ranges that are not supposed to be used uh, to terminate uh, traffic, and uh, many 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 ISPs, including government network operators, don't put the filters in at the edge of their networks that are just standardized, well defined, um, well understood. They're, it's just not done. Likewise, people, you, people make their edge routers um, publicly addressable. It's, uh, again, not best practice. There are documents that tell you not to do it. You're supposed to use link local addressing for your AS to AS edge router to edge router um, uh, um, um, links, and people don't do it. They make their routers publicly addressable. And what this means is people can go in and take advantage of another problem, which is the persistent use of factory default user IDs and passwords instead of just changing them to something else. Uh, that plus a public IP address equals easily hijackable uh, routers, which equals um, the kind of route leaking that I mentioned before, which combined with CA vulnerabilities gives you the chance to hijack, you know, the most secure transactions on the internet without anybody noticing. So anyway, these uh, externalities on the network through, uh, expressed through um, uh, bad practices uh, is, broadly speaking, the thing that we need to fix. Um, the case study that we're working on today is one example where I think we might actually be able to make progress. Um, but it's not the only one, and these themes and these processes need to be replicated in many different areas if we're actually going to make the Internet uh, merit the trust that people now, 2 billion people around mm -hmm. the world, are placing in it. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. So why don't the panelists come on up and, and grab some seats. I will say, if you're, if you're like myself, uh, when you first learn about these kinds of things, you know, I was always thinking, like, secure and not secure, you know, the, the little lock shows up and then I know everything's fine, but actually it's more like a probability field, so it's like you have a high likelihood of security at this point in time, and it's interesting because I think we don't really teach these best practices. Andrew just went through about half a dozen of them. And I can't tell you how many times I've been working on networks and either root and admin gets you into the network devices or my favorite, of course, the admin slash change me password. Uh, and this happens all the time. So why don't we turn it over to folks um, who want to do this whole panel and uh, we will open it up to audience Q&A afterwards. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm Chris Segoyan. I'm a uh, graduate fellow at Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. 
I'll be moderating this panel. Um, before I introduce everyone, I do want to take one quick minute to, to talk about why I'm interested in this problem. I've been interested in this space re a lot for the last year. Uh, last uh, October, I went to a surveillance conference, a closed door surveillance conference here in Washington, DC, where I uh, was walking through the trade show floor and, and came across one company called Packet Forensics. They're an Arizona company that make a four by four square inch surveillance device that they you can, you can put on any network uh, they, they say it's for the internet cafe problem, uh, to, to spy on people in internet cafes, and their sales materials talked about how it, it could be used with compelled certificates. How uh, the, the, the companies or governments buying this product could legally, in their jurisdiction, go to a court and compel the creation of a certificate for, for rogue access and then use this device to monitor people's communications. This is a U.S. company. Uh, in March of this year, I released a paper outlining this problem and proposing some potential fixes. Um, but this product is exported around the world. The company, uh, on, their pub on their website, on packetforensics.com, uh, lists the export requirements. They do require uh, an export license from Commerce. Uh, I've submitted FOIA requests to Commerce to get a list of the governments to which Packet Forensics has exported their product. Um, they won't tell me. But uh, I, I am interested in this problem because uh, unlike Andrew, I'm willing to, to name the names that, that I'm concerned about. And uh, uh, I think that it's uh, somewhat troubling that a, a consumer in Iowa who's connected to their bank in New York has to trust the Latvian or Tunisian or Chinese government to, uh, to secure their, their transactions. So that's what brought me to this space. Uh, and uh, I'm so super excited to be part of this, uh, to be moderating this panel and to be able to bring some of these, these folks here. So um, I think it actually would be better if, if the folks on the panel just introduce themselves because they know their own achievements better than I do. So, Adam, why don't you start? Uh, hi, I'm Adam Langley from Google. Uh, I prim primarily work on Chrome, uh, although I do encryption stuff across Google. Scott Ray with uh, DigiCert. Um, I have a couple of roles with DigiCert. Uh, one is to uh, architect the, the PKIs that they uh, uh, utilize, and the other is to maintain a relationship with uh, government and education users of DigiCert services. Uh, I'm Peter Eckersley. I'm a senior staff technologist at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We're a, a membership-based uh, digital civil liberties group. Uh, and the particular uh, interest that I bring to this problem is, aside from the fact that EFF, our organization, has been a long-standing defender of, of people's privacy and their right to use encryption on the internet, uh, we've been running a number of projects specifically on this problem uh, and one in particular called the SSL Observatory that I'll talk about uh, in more detail during my talk. Uh, I'm Andy Stengerbill of PayPal. Uh, I run a team working on internet standards and governance, uh, actually working on solving uh, or participating in solving a whole bunch of the problems that Andrew outlined. I'm Ari Schwartz. I'm an uh, internet policy advisor at the National Institute for, of Standards and Technology. All right, so we're going to have each uh, each of the first three folks talk for about five to ten minutes, uh, some of their thoughts, and then we'll have the last two uh, respond. Then I will ask maybe one or two questions, then we'll open it up to the audience. I would ask you to please use the microphone, because in addition to this room, we have, I think, more than 50 people listening on the internet. So um, we have an audience out there, so, so please use the mics. So why don't you start off, Adam? Uh, well, I think Peter should go first. Oh, OK. Well, Peter, then why don't you start? OK. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the reasons why we were concerned about the, the way that uh, SSL certificates uh, are organized at the moment. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of the specific research that we've been doing on, on the scope and, and precise character of that problem. Now, the, re the game we're worried about here, uh, there are many versions of it, but, but examples include the the person in Iowa uh, who might have to worry about the Eastern European mafia impersonating their bank, so that when you go to your bank, you try and type in your username and password, some, some non-governmental criminal organization in some other part of the world has a way of hijacking your account at that point, and your, your browser shows the lock icon and everything looks secure, but you're talking to the wrong person. Um, or perhaps it's a, a, a US business person who's traveling overseas, and it might be a foreign intelligence agency. Uh, that's going to inject itself as a man in the middle and obtain access to confidential corporate information. Um, or it might be a, a hacker of some sort who wants to just read someone's Gmail and then there's the little lock icon on Gmail, but uh, maybe that's defeatable. And the reasons that we're concerned about this fall into uh, basically two categories. One reason, this is a big picture thing, it's a structural problem, um, 
We talk about the race to the bottom. Uh, other previous talk speakers have spoken about the race to the bottom. But what's really going on here is, and I want to underscore this, it only takes one certificate authority to have signed the bad guy, the attacker's certificate, and then it will work. Uh, and what that means is that it does, the, the practices of the best certificate authorities don't matter very much. It doesn't matter that there are 10 or 20 or 100 uh, certificate authorities that are doing the right thing. All that matters is that there's one certificate authority that is either uh, malicious or merely they made a mistake. They, they were, in some respects, they made a technical mistake or one of their computers got broken into by a hacker and suddenly uh, their key can be used to produce a certificate that looks every bit as legitimate uh, to your browser as, as one from a company that does the right thing. Uh, so this is a structural problem, and it means that we we really only have the security of the the worst of however many certificate authorities there are. And I'll talk about how many there are later on. The other reason for concern is, uh, let me try and provide a metaphor for what, what goes on inside those certificates. Um, they're like, they're paperwork. It's paperwork saying, this website you're talking to really is your bank. Um, and it's a particular form called X509. Uh, and this, this particular form, this document, was defined before the web existed. Uh, and that should tell you something about how complicated it is. It's actually so complicated it, it might make the IRS blush. It's, it's an amazing uh, piece of, uh, of, of uh, intricate bureaucracy that gets fed into your browser. It has lots of different things that can be written into it. Uh, and the meanings of some of those fields are somewhat ambiguous uh, and overlapping. And so w when we look at the internet and say, well, what's going on when we trust a website? Well, there's this system of these millions of forms flying around. They're complicated. They're receiving stamps from these organizations. The organizations can delegate their stamps to other people. It's all being passed around as this giant stream of paperwork. And then one of these things gets fed into your browser, and it makes an automated uh, computational decision to say, yes, trust this. And uh, we've, we've seen in, in recent years of at least three or four instances of uh, errors by certificate authorities understandable errors, nonetheless uh, errors, uh, that have led to the existence of certificates that would allow an Eastern European mafia organization or an intelligence agency or anything to fool any browser into believing that any website was any other one. Uh, and so we were worried about how many of these certificate authorities are out there and, and, and whether these problems are fixable. So what we decided to do was to collect the data. No one actually really seemed to know how many certificate authorities were in existence because there's a list that's trusted by your browser, but we don't know how many other organizations they've delegated to uh, and what they've signed. Uh, so what we did is we created this thing called the SSL Observatory. Uh, we got a list of every possible IP address on the internet. Um, you, you might remember those things are the four numbers with, with dots in the middle the address of every computer on the internet, uh, or sorry, every computer on the internet has one of these addresses that you can use to speak to it. We wrote them all down. There are about between three and four billion of them. And we went to every single one to see if it might be running a secure HTTPS web server. And if it was, uh, we just downloaded the certificates that it had. And what we found was there are about 12 million of these certificates out there. Uh, only about... 1.3 million of them are ones that your that any browser will just accept uh, and show the lock icon and not raise that funny warning uh, that you see. And we looked inside those to see how many organizations were issuing them. Uh, we found that there are 1,500 uh, of those stamps or, or fingerprints, as Ed Slides uh, showed them, uh, that can, can sign these things and a browser will believe them. And they're controlled by about 650 organizations. So that's probably a, a very large and alarming number of organizations if we're playing that game where it's the weakest of the 650 organizations that determines our overall level of security. Um, and then specifically, we also found when we scanned, scanned the, the whole thing that there were, of course, a number of problems. There, were, there, were, there was evidence that in some instances the certificate authorities had made mistakes and signed 
pieces of paperwork that they shouldn't have signed. Now, of course, all the examples that we pulled out and talked about, instantly those certificate authorities went and, and got their revocation stamps out and, and, and put the, stamp, the revocation stamp on that document. Um, and so none of those certificate authorities will be removed from Firefox or from Microsoft or from Apple's trust lists. Uh, but the, the concern is, well, how do we know that these people aren't going to make another mistake on a future occasion when it's a foreign intelligence agency that's the beneficiary of the mistake? Uh, and I don't think we do right now. Um, we found other things that are, are worth talking about. Um, one is that some of the organizations really don't look that trustworthy. Uh, the one that we put at the top of our untrustworthy list is Atisalat, which is a, um, a state-owned uh, telecommunications company in the United Arab, Arab Emirates that has been documented to have installed s spy software on BlackBerry users' devices in that country, hundreds of thousands of them, uh, and to have used different kinds of certificates to sign that spyware. So that you, the BlackBerry wouldn't accept the spyware unless it was signed with a magic key, and they, Atisalat went and got the key and signed the spyware. Uh, and Atisalat has also been at the center of the recent very public controversy over whether uh, BlackBerry will be allowed to continue providing secure encryption in the United, Ar United Arab Emirates. And so we were alarmed to see that they were indeed in the list of, browser, uh, of CAs that are trusted by all of our browsers. Now, interestingly, they're not actually in that list explicitly. Neither Microsoft nor Firefox nor Apple has decided that a TSLAT is a trustworthy party that should have one of these uh, CA certificates. In fact, the way that they got in there is that there's a Belgian company called Cybertrust that had chosen to delegate to a TSLAT. And Cybertrust is now a division of Verizon. So we wrote an open letter. There was a New York Times piece about it saying, can you at least look into this and, and think about whether maybe you want to change your mind about that decision? Uh, but we're not going to fix things that way. We might get a TSLAT removed from the list, so that's one of the 650 organizations. But we're still in a situation where ex we're exposed to 50 jurisdictions or so, um, and where we might not be able to spot which of these organizations is the one that's going to get hacked um, next. So I think that going forward, what we should be talking about is building, not throwing out this system. I think it, it has some important properties that we, we want to keep. Um, but looking at building systematic cross-checks for it so that it's not just a certificate authority that determines when you get the lock icon, but there's some backup mechanism. DNSSEC is a, is a very promising looking option, and we cross-check with that. So that's all I have to say for now. Right, thank you, Peter. Um, so as I said, uh, I work mainly on Chrome, which is Google's web browser. Uh, I should say Google Chrome. And I'd like to give a, a quick rundown of some of the, the issues that we see uh, as a browser manufacturer uh, in this space. So obviously, the first point is that we're talking about transport security today. Uh, and I think we get a little bit of a free reign because transport security sucks somewhat less than other aspects of computer security. And at the moment, the chosen method for people stealing your bank account is to take over your computer via exploits in one or more applications. So while, while those are currently the weakest link, they're getting better and they're getting better fast. So I think the pressure on transport security might increase very rapidly quite soon. And though as a browser vendor, we, uh, we basically have to consider the internet as a, an ecosystem as a whole. So although there may be 650 CA organizations, that's completely dwarfed by the number of servers out there, which in turn is completely dwarfed by the number of clients out there. And considering this ecosystem, more than half of the users on it are users using Windows XP and Internet Explorer, which means that they're using a 10-year-old piece of software to do all of this checking and encryption. And that was released 10 years ago, and about 50% of Windows machines are currently <laughs> Windows XP. So if we come up with a brandful idea today, and Microsoft agrees to put it in the next release of Windows, I will be retired by the point that that release of Windows accounts for 95% of Windows machines out there. Some people in this room will have died of old age. So on the one hand, it's very hard to change the clients. It's also very hard to change the servers. 
we still have to deal with uh, internet sites out there which don't implement not the, the current version of this, which was standardized about 10 years ago. They don't properly implement the last version. And we still pay every year a significant complexity cost in dealing with these old versions of software. And there are no incentives for these servers to update because it works just fine, because we have to deal with them because there are so many out there. Uh, and thirdly, many companies want to, um, well, they have a, a number of reasons for wanting to look at what their users are doing on the internet. They might want to block certain sites because they don't consider it appropriate at work, or they have legal obligations to look at what information is exiting their organization. And they do this by doing something which looks almost exactly like an attack. They, you know, the browser sees websites signed by certificates they're not meant to be signed by because they're actually signed by your company. They, you know, they're signed by your company, LTD, says that this is this website, and actually it's a computer in your company's back office which is reading everything that's going through for perfectly legitimate reasons. But it does mean that um, for many of these issues, we cannot do things that we would like to do because this looks exactly like an attack and we can't tell the difference. Uh, however, these companies have strong incentives to look at all of the traffic. In fact, sometimes they have legal requirements to do so, but they have no incentives uh, to think about the internet as a whole and how we move forwards while meeting their needs. Uh, so I think, I mean, from a browser's point of view, these are the issues that we see. And we want desperately to improve the lives of our users. Um, and Chrome at least still has an idealistic bent, whereas some of our larger competitors are more bound by not breaking things. Uh, we are more willing to be aggressive in this space and to deploy new technologies. Um, but it is worth keeping in mind that the internet is very large and it's very hard to steer these days. So my role is to give the perspective of the uh, the CAs, I represent the CAs, and uh, you know we're one of the well, DigiCert is one of the 650 that uh, Peter mentioned, um, and I think that we everybody agrees that uh, not all CAs were created equal, and uh, we don't necessarily have um, processes or policies in place that allow us to be able to grade the CAs and work out, well, you know, who are in that bottom 10% that we maybe want to chop off here. Um, so that's a challenge. Um, I, I don't know if I necessarily subscribe to the race to the bottom um, condition. I, I recognise that there are some that are heading in that direction. Um, I've had the opportunity to work for two different um, uh, CAs that would be listed in that 650 over my lifetime. And, and both those organisations, um, their core mantra um, was trust. And uh, if you do something wrong, uh, sure, you know, mistakes happen from time to time, but if you do something wrong, you, you have that capacity to impact your um, paying <coughs> customers and, um, you know, they vote with their feet or they vote with their wallets and, and they go somewhere else. Uh, trust is something that is difficult to cultivate. Um, and typically, um, I mean, my own definition of trust, and I'm looking at this from an end user perspective, is, you know, I trust something if it behaves the way that I expect it to behave on a consistent basis. Now, that would tend to mean that I would have to have a relationship over time with the entity in order to establish trust. And when we meet things for the first time, um, we obviously have no relationship, so what do we base trust on? Um, typically, we, uh, well, at least I do, and most people that I've spoken to, will um, base trust on, you know, there's somebody else that you trust who refers that service to you, or, or is someone who's a trusted introducer of something that you then intend to trust. And so um, in the context that we've been talking about here, you know, we have CAs that need to act as a trusted third party, an IE, an entity that should be trusted. And I think from a user's perspective, we have browsers that are being the trusted introducer here. They're saying, look, we're going to include these CAs in our root store. You should be able to trust them. Um, and um, 
at least from a user's perspective, that's typically their mindset because that's typically what they're used to interacting with on a daily basis. Um, it's all well and good to have trust. Um, uh, I think it was Ronald Reagan who said trust but verify. Is that right? Um, so, so we should also verify. And, and typically, um, before coming to DigiCert, I was a, a, at a Dartmouth College and conducted a lot of research in this area and perpetrated some of these attacks on unsuspecting students and staff and suspecting students and staff. And it's, these attacks are very easy to do even in a local area. Uh, one of the issues that we have is, um, and, and I take uh, Adam's point that, you know, we may have this little window of time where maybe right now we don't have so much pressure on, you know, transport security. Um, the focus, I think, right now is endpoint security, and that is really the weakest link at the moment. And my experience is that users make inferences about things that they see in their browser, about the lock, about the green bar, that may not necessarily um, be true. Um, and we don't necessarily have the tools available today to be able to deliver to the user the information in a way in which they could um, consume it succinctly uh, in order to be able to make a trust decision. However, if the user wants to spend the time, the tools are there. For instance, for you know, public CAs who are in browsers or root stores of operating systems, you know, they have to publish a, a public policy that says, here's how we do things. And then they have to publish a practice statement which says, you know, here's specifically how we implement the things that we said we're going to do. And then they have to be audited against that by presumably reputable organisations. Um, however, you know, even some of the standards out there that are adhered to by public CAs um, perhaps are lacking in the depth that they need to go in to verify some of these things. Um, <clears throat> I have had the opportunity to work in, I know that Steve put up earlier in a list of some of the standards bodies. Uh, some of the private bodies that were listed up there, the federal uh, PKI for instance, uh, Safe Biopharma. Um, there are other bridge CAs that operate on a, a um, private basis. And, and they actually enforce rules around the way that CAs operate. They actually map the policies that these CAs uh, propose to follow um, against a standard and they give a message to their community that says, you know, this CA is operating at this level of assurance and the credentials that they're issuing, um, you know, can be trusted um, a certain amount and they grade the levels of assurance and this has actually published standards around level of assurance. Now, Granted, m most of those and those communities that I was just mentioning, you know, FPKI and, and SAFE and the CERTAPATH in defence and aerospace industry and uh, there's the research and education bridge certificate authority as well in, in the education space and research space. Um, <clears throat> all of those um, are, are typically focused around um, user certificates that an individual is holding, which is really the other end of the authentication piece that we've been talking about. But we could equally apply um, the same process to SSL certs to be able to verify, you know, the end of the transaction that we're talking to. And so there are standards bodies out there. And for the 650 CAs that Peter mentioned, you know, there is CAB Forum, the CA and Browser Forum, um, which browsers and CAs participate on, which, you know, has been around since about 2005. And, and they did publish a standard about, um, you know, the thing that they realised, the community realised, was that there were standards that were missing. There was not consistent ways in which sites were actually authenticated, etc. And so they realised that something needed to change. Just you know, before Peter's study, which is making these things public, we realised that there are some members of the community who maybe aren't as altruistic in maintaining the, the levels of trust that we, we think should be there for uh, the types of services that are being provided. And so CAB Forum have published um, a set of standards, uh, certainly for the extended validation, which actually talks about um, 
the processes that have to go through. And it's rigorous to be able to be accredited against that. Now, um, the first c uh, CA that I worked to, um, and DigiCert does the same thing today, I think are, are very good CAs from the point of view that they followed these standards already. And, and I was actually surprised, maybe I was a little naive, uh, I was somewhat surprised that all CAs weren't doing the same thing because I thought this was just expected behaviour. But that was my perspective as an end user. And so as an end user, when I see a lock on the browser, that communicates something to me that might communicate something different to somebody else. And I think one of the issues that we need to address is how do we get that message right to the users and how can we present to the users in a succinct way um, that there are differences behind who is actually securing uh, the ends of their transaction that they're doing across the internet. All right, so Andy, uh, why don't you respond? And then Ari, uh, you can respond after. Sure. So a couple of things struck me um, from, from this morning. And the, I think, so what we're working on, or, you know, I mentioned that we're working on solving a bunch of these problems. And I think that Stephen got it just right when he, when he talked about a chain of trust. And that it, as you look at everything that has to go right for, the, for a user when they're sitting at, at the coffee shop or at their house uh, to get to the, the site they're trying to go to, they have to trust their operating system, and they have to trust the the little DSL router that they have in their in their house, or their the wireless access point they're connected to, maybe even the one that tells you uh, to ignore the warning message, um, or they they have to click through a paywall at the at the hotel, um, and they have to trust uh, their ISP and whoever's providing DNS services to them, and they have to trust um, the the DN how the data got into the DNS in the first place. They have to trust the uh, the site that they actually connect to is being run properly and the certificate there and so on. So there's this huge long chain of things that have to go right in order for the user to get to the, the site. And so in that sense, uh, TLS and certificates and so on are just one, one small piece of it, but there, uh, and, and there wasn't a lot of additional security there or a lot of these issues didn't come up until I'd say over the last couple of years we've seen a, a lot more attacks against these bits of the infrastructure. So whether it's people presenting at Black Hat of, of creating fake certificates, excuse me, fake certificates, or uh, using technical vulnerabilities, injecting uh, fake data into the certificate to pretend that one certificate is really uh, the one for another site. It wasn't until uh, the last couple of years that these these problems actually became pressing. I think, and so. Uh, the, the genesis of this is really a whole bunch of research that people have done to show just how bad the situation is, whether it's, it's Peter's research or, uh, or others. Uh, and the, but whose responsibility it is to fix it, I think, you, I want to hit on something that Adam said, and it's that you know, technology changes slowly. Um, and that, that's true, uh, but if you look at, for example, Internet Explorer 6, the campaign that there's been out there to get rid of it over a period of time, I think it's actually been quite successful. And don't underestimate the, the power of social media or of certain large websites to actually make progress on that problem. So to the extent that YouTube says, uh, you can't view any of our really cool features, uh, and if you're running IE6, you have to upgrade your web browser, all of a sudden IE6, and Facebook does the same thing, all of a sudden the usage rates of IE6 uh, start to plummet. Uh, drastically, and they have over, say, the last six months. And I don't think it's, you know, I don't have proof, but I, I think it's not entirely coincidental uh, that really popular websites decided to, to actually use some of their uh, cachet slash authority uh, to actually get that end result. Um, so I don't think we're powerless in trying to in trying to get that changed, and we've just got to chip away at it. One of the things that, that so I. Uh, sort of shameless plug for a sec that one of the things we did in reaction to some of the, the research that happened over the last couple of years was to put out a thing called strict transport security, which tries to, which in its first version tries to make sure that your web browser always uses SSL uh, when it's connecting on the network. Uh, a site can tell your web browser, from now on always connect to me with SSL or TLS. Don't use uh, something insecure. And so so that, that rogue access point, uh, that uh, spoof DNS provider, um, doesn't have nearly as much capability to, to compromise the end node when the node tries to, when the when the customer or the computer tries to actually make only encrypted connections. And there's a lot more we can do there, but I'm I'm actually optimistic 
that we're going to make progress against it. The next piece being uh, the issue that was touched on uh, extensively today of one of exclusion. That is, uh, we do want to be able to say we only use these certificate authorities and no others and have users be able to tell that. And there's, I think, a lot of ideological debate whether we should achieve that via um, cooperative measures of the certificate authorities following sets of policies to only issue certificates or whether we should embed that via certificates uh, and or hinting information in DNSSEC. Um, but I'm not actually quite so pessimistic that we'll, we'll make progress on this. Um, it's already happening, and as we see uh, HTTPS becoming more ubiquitous um, due to some of the work, and, and Peter sort of stole one of the, the names of a project I was going to have, which was HTTPS Everywhere. And I think that one of the reasons this hasn't got as much focus is that not as many sites actually use these technologies. And so as we get more and more people using these on a daily basis. It becomes part of your experience everywhere rather than at just a few sites on the internet. Some of these problems will become substantially more pressing and some of the some of the other people that tend to try to hijack connections or paywall vendors that do uh, nasty things like give you a fake certificate warning, all of that starts to, to solve itself once these technologies become more widely used. So I uh, actually had down at the top of my page as, as well from uh, what Andy said at the end of talking about the chain of trust as well. I, I, I like the way that Andy uh, put it out there in terms of walking through. I think of that as kind of the mi the macro chain of trust, right? The steps that, that a user has to go through that you, you need to – that everyone along the chain needs to trust them each other. But then within each of those chains of trust, you know, you have micro chains of trust, which is really what Steve laid out with, with um, folks trusting each other even within that, even within some of those spaces of the other, the links of the chains um, there. And I think that that's a, really a good way to, to think about some of this stuff. I did want to highlight, you know, there, there was some, there, there's some talk of that, uh, about this, that, that there were, we have some solutions out there. I also think that it's important to note that, um, uh, that there are folks in government that are paying attention to this problem. Um, I, 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 in the Cyber, Cyberstorm 3 um, exercise that just went on, um, uh, I, I asked, uh, some of the some of these uh, uh, attacks were simulated, and I actually asked uh, DHS if it was okay to talk about it. They said that at the level of saying that certificate authorities and, and uh, related DNS issues were raised through that uh, set of simulated attacks, um, that uh, that it was it was okay to do that. So I think that it's worth pointing out that um, there are, there has been a lot of talk about that uh, about these kind of attacks as. Uh, real life uh, examples of things that could go terribly wrong if not taken care of, and we and if we don't have solutions for. Also, I think you know there's room for hope as well in the way that the the, um, the implementation of DNSSEC at the root that that Andrew talked about um, when was put into place in July, um, and the, the, just the process for that happening, uh, what was uh, really I think positive because it it showed that um, it, it, the Department of Commerce where I work. Um, you, you know, could work with ICANN and co help to help to coordinate with ICANN and Verisign and, and others uh, in industry to build a solution that's not a government mandate, but it, it really it really moves us forward uh, to get a solution that's been known out there, but um, that hasn't been implemented yet. So I think that that's something that is um, uh, uh, very useful for uh, um, kind of models for moving forward down in, for some of these solutions, um, especially because I, I really do think I do I agree with Andrew uh, Andrew's main point here that that incentives are uh, really one of the main issues that we have to to, to work on here. For for enterprises right now, there are at least some solutions that are out there, and uh, the there are folks in. Um, th that, uh, you know, good uh, administrators can, can ha have some tools at their disposal out there and, and can work in that way. For, for individuals, I think it's a lot harder out there, and I think Scott uh, um, kind of got to some of those points there. Um, first of all, um, the, the idea that uh, an individual would have to read the certificate and then read about the certificate authority um, every so for every certificate that they downloaded is just not going to work. I mean, it's it's not possible. Um, so you need to have some kinds of higher levels of trust, and that's where the it's parts of this. Uh, we need to put new links in the chain that if we're strengthen some of those links in the chain of trust to, to continue down that analogy um, to get uh, to get to the point where individual users are um, are, are really involved. I, I, I also want to tack on something here. So that, I think that that incentives point and how we get those, those incentives is something that's important for the Internet Policy Task Force um, that Commerce, 
the Commerce Department is, is uh, um, um, has uh, is moving forward on some of these issues in in the cybersecurity work that we're doing. We have a no, we had a notice of inquiry out there. Um, one of the things actually that's been coming up in some of those conversations is this issue of levels of assurance um, that's got mentioned as well, which actually comes from it's actually not in this standard. It's a um, OMB memo, uh, the infamous uh, M0404, um, for those that, that are that, that want to follow up on that. But um, it is, has been in part of NIST guidance since then, since it went out. And um, I think that, it, and it was designed for the U.S. government's use. It was not designed for this kind of situation. But I, I, I think people really resonated with the ideas that we do need levels of assurance. And the question is whether we need, we have the right levels for different purposes today. And I think that's something else that we're thinking of here. And I think in this case, it is something that would be helpful for people to um, think about, is how do we get to those right le levels of assurance so we can design solutions that work for these different levels. And in this space, I think that that would be helpful, too. So uh, if people have ideas on that, that's something that we didn't ask a direct question on in our NOI, but um, something that we're exploring right now. Um, so with that, I'll open it up. All right, so I'm going to ask one question, and then I, I think we can probably turn it to the audience. Um, so consumers don't know the names of any certificate authorities. Maybe they know Symantec now that they've bought VeriSign. Um, but they do know the names of the web browser that they're using. Well, some consumers at least know the name of the web browser. Um, and the browser vendors in their privacy policies all say that we will protect your privacy. Some even say we will protect your security. Um, do you think that the browser vendors have an affirmative obligation to follow through with those promises? Um, do you think that the lock icon implies uh, more than sort of the small print that, that's currently there? And uh, and I guess a, a related question would be, do we have a well-functioning market in, the, in this place? Or, or do we actually have a market failure with regard to the security and privacy that the browsers are delivering to consumers with regard to the certificate authority issue? Anyone who wants to take a stab? Um, <laughs> so, uh, as someone who's who's writing this stuff, um, certainly Google does not accept any legal obligations, blah, blah, blah. Um, but <laughs> I, I try to do the best I can um, for the users, and we're perfectly well aware that well, every so often we get a bug report, and you know, the user says, every time I go to this site, I get this big red page I have to click through, please get rid of it. And it's like, oh... Um, and we, we know that whenever we throw up certificate errors, all the user sees is blah, 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 get on with my day, deal with crap. And they get rid of them immediately. And it's the case that whenever we ask a user a security question, it's almost inevitably a cop-out. Uh, we didn't know what the right answer was, so we copped out and asked the user. And we are unfortunately somewhat tied into this legacy um, because so many sites out there don't have correct certificates. You know, they are imposing an externality on us that we can't do what we want. And the users, although they want security in the abstract, in any practical case, they just want to get their work done. So they kind of want security for, for everybody else, but not quite for them today, because I need to do this. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's, again, very complicated. And we, we have an obligation to, to people to do the best that we can. But if we, I feel that you, your premise of your question uh, is sort of too small in scope in that the, the problem is so large and has so many actors and they have so many different incentives that we can't simply go like, do we have an obligation and are we meeting it? Um, there are many obligations that we try to meet as best we can. Uh, Scott and Peter? Sure. Or, uh, I wanted to jump in on the, uh, the market failure question. Because uh, market failure, of course, those are powerful magic words. And uh, if you look at the situation right now with the 650 certificate authorities and the fact that you know, people talk about the chain of trust and it had that alarmingly long kind of 10, 10 people in it, but I'm going to try and use another metaphor. With the 650, you actually have all 650 in your chain of trust because you're trusting none of them to mess up and sign the thing you didn't want signed, uh, or, or the bad guy certificate. Um, so this market, if you looked at it in isolation, perhaps you could say, this is going to fail. This is, there's no, this, the structure here for this particular microeconomic market doesn't look right. Uh, but d does this mean that we have market failure in the, the classical sense that 
now we need the government to step in and, and regulate? I think probably not. I think what we want to see is, is these efforts to build cross-checks and to build some other uh, backup mechanism, a, a safety valve, for this, this certificate authority system. Uh, we want to see those, the conversations we're having today and, and a lot of other productive conversations that are happening uh, right now because people have realized that this is a problem. We want to see those play out and see what happens. And I'm hopeful that in five years' time, we'll actually have some of these cross-checks in place. Um, and so then perhaps the implicit question behind is there a market failure here is, well, you know, is there something, something that the government should be doing? Uh, the answer is yes, maybe funding and, and applying resources to these cross-check uh, problems and, and doing the R&D, helping us with the R&D to make sure that those get deployed. So I just wanted to echo what Adam was saying too about um, you know when a user, their objective when they're in a session is really to get their work done. And um, you know security, it's kind of like security in the internet, it's, it was an afterthought. Um, you know, the assumption at the beginning was everybody were good actors and, you know, we're doing research and we want to help each other out and then it expanded to something that was commercial and beyond. And, you know, when somebody is using their networks, they just want to get their thing done. And we have actually conducted research um, that proves they will click through as many, um, you know, pop-ups that Adam or any other... A browser vendor wants to put in front of them because their objective is to get their work done and they're not considering, oh, and then afterwards, when they've done that, they might then check to make sure there's a lock. We've done a pretty good job of training people to look for a lock, but what they interpret from that lock is something totally, totally different. And so I think there still needs to be um, some education efforts that, that need to happen. Um, you know, and further research, the type of stuff that Peter's been doing that helps highlight these issues is really, really important. Um, but again, there needs to be a paradigm switch, I think, within the user community. And we can control that somewhat in enterprises, but within the general public, it becomes infinitely more difficult. Do you guys want to take a stab at this, or do you? I mean, I'll say, you know, um, the we have a lot of issues out there in the cybersecurity space, right, that have solutions that people don't implement. I mean, Andrew went through a long list of them, um, but, uh, um, the, the, you know, there, all of the problems that we've ever had in cybersecurity seem to continue with us down the road as we add new ones on top of them, right? So um, there is, I think there's a, a more fundamental problem in terms of, um, you know, how do we go about do, getting these incentive questions right in general in the broader sense, right? Um, and some of that is on the browsers, and um, I certainly think there, are, you know, you can point to positive things that browser makers have done to improve security and actually take steps for the consumers. So I don't think that uh, it's completely, uh, it, it, that we're completely at the point where they're not doing what they're saying, which is the, that they're completely ignoring uh, security. The question is that the, how to get them to do it in the right way and to work with others in doing it. Um, and we, we have to do a better job in general. The whole industry has to do a better job on, in that front. And I think there's general agreement with that statement. I mean, I haven't heard anyone that disagrees and says, you know, that, that uh, it, it, it's one, one link's fault here that's, that's the main, main flaw here. Um, but I, I do think that, um, uh, that, that, we, that everyone has to step up and, and work a little harder on it. Um, I th and, and because we still have that attitude, I don't think you can really say that it's a market failure yet uh, in, in, in the truest sense. I could just touch on one point. Um, I think it, it goes back to what both Scott and Adam said, and, and that is that ultimately users are in control of their computer, but every time we ask them a security question, we're giving them the chance to make a mistake. And so, for example, one of the design decisions we made in, in STS was that once, once you've set that header, if your site tries to connect to uh, if your computer tries to connect to something that's broken, it's got a self-signed certificate that doesn't validate uh, or something like that. It generates a warning, a failure, but it doesn't give you the, the user an opportunity to click through because in that case we're quite certain uh, that this is fraudulent and there's no reason to allow the user to keep going because this is exactly what an attack looks like. And so the, the so much of the discussion about assurance and what the user expects hinges on human-computer interaction uh, and that, that field as it relates to security indicators and how users deal with phishing sites and all of that is so new 
um, or fairly new, really, uh, in the grand scheme of things. I, I think we don't yet have great answers as to what should the, the computing experience look like that gets users to make fewer security choices or incents them to make the right choices or doesn't allow them to make bad choices or, or what have you. Um, and we haven't really solved that yet. It's still uh, under heavy evolution. And so anything that relies on uh, or almost anything that relies on end users making choices, uh, determining assurance levels, and oh, this was a high assurance site, therefore I'm going to type in my, my password, um, I think is fraught with, with difficulty in the, in the current environment. So there, there's, you know, there's a lot of work to be done on that soft piece of, of interaction before we can actually solve a lot of these problems. All right, so let's uh, go to a question from the audience. Um, do we have a microphone or do people just have to shout? So let's get that going. Um, I think. Yeah, well, oh, there is a mic. So can you take it to the gentleman in the tie uh, right there? Oh, sorry, yeah, this is DC, right? <laughs> the gentleman in the tie and suit. Yeah. I'm glad to be non identifiable in this crowd. Um, so, uh, uh, two questions, I think. Um, the, f the first is so. Uh, I haven't heard a lot in, about revocation in this discussion so far. I mean, there's, there's a lot of discussion of, of taking down a certificate authority from the browser's point of view, one of the high level, the 650. But um, do we have even reliable statistics on which certificate authorities are, I mean, there's no perfect audit, but are doing some auditing, are assiduously revoking certificates that appear to be misused? And can't do, I mean, other than saying someone like, Edisalat is is suspicious because of their other activities. Can we say these people look like they're actually doing some kind of successful audit, and these people are not? And the the second question is, uh, a lot of this discussion has been very focused on business to consumer transactions and the browser as a means for the consumer to reach a business. And while I'm, I would be sad if the user in Iowa could not reach her bank successfully, I would be sadder if the controller of a nuclear power plant were to enter the controls to a nuclear power plant under the mistaken apprehension that he was talking to the actual control system. So do we have statistics on B2C uses or um, user to control system uses for certificates from these certificate authorities? and? Are the B2B or uh, control system users relying on reliable certificate authorities or unreliable certificate authorities? I can talk about the first question. Uh, so in the course of, of doing this observatory project and scanning all the, the IP addresses, we also looked at revocation. Uh, not as systematically, uh, but I'll say a few things. One, revocation is happening a lot. There are enormous numbers of certificates that are being issued and then revoked, uh, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because the mechanism's there and it's being used. It's a bad thing because it's evidence that also a lot of these certificates are being issued that shouldn't have been issued. Uh, and then we look specifically at one problem. There's a, a bug that was in some software a couple of years ago that, that meant that if you, you happen to use that software to generate what's called your private key, um, then you essentially wouldn't get a private private key and other people could eavesdrop on your encrypted communications or, or interpose themselves in those communications. And so uh, because this was a known bug from a few years ago, we were able to look for it. We were able to say how many certificates out there on the internet uh, for live websites that are still valid uh, are actually now using these, these keys that anyone could just go and break into. Um, and we found about 28,000 websites out there that were using these insecure keys. Um, fortunately, only 500 of those were, uh, were <coughs> valid white websites that wouldn't have raised the certificate warning for some other reason. But some of those were very high-value websites. There was a, a, the diplomatic arm of a government that I won't name. Um, uh, it's not the United States. It was, it was elsewhere. Um, there, were, there were webmail systems that you know have the email of some very powerful, important people on them just sitting there with these insecure keys. And so it was alarming to see that sort of stuff. And then we went back and looked at for these certifications of insecure keys, this is the kind of thing that a certificate authority should be able to catch. They actually should have a record of all the public keys that they've signed, and when a bug like this occurs, uh, so that 
it's known that certain public keys and, and private key pairs are, are terrible and shouldn't be used, the certificate authority can go back through its records and issue a revocation for every one of those things that it had signed. Um, and so in our slide, I don't actually have the, the, the list in front of me, but we had a, a good list and a bad list. There were some certificate authorities that appeared to have spotted this or for other reasons they'd revoked these certificates and then a bad list where they, they really hadn't. Um, so those are if anyone else wants around. to do it quickly so that we can take a, another, another question I'll, I'll quick to say so revocation was an interesting <coughs> an interesting case again of uh, different parties and different incentives when it came to the technical aspects of revocation the users got all the costs um, the server operators there's you know there's a spectrum of who could pay the costs of having to be able to do revocation <coughs> and the users got all of them which means that revocation does not work at all on many platforms because those platforms were not willing to pay these high costs any mobile devices you have will probably not check for revocation whatsoever. Um, and again, you know, this is because the server operators didn't want to have to deal with the issues, um, and the users, often unrepresented, got everything. All right, uh, Alex at the front, did you have a question? Uh, it's actually straightforward in the uh, consumer side. So, uh, Alex Howard O'Reilly Media, I'm supposed to identify myself, uh, trust, and then verify. Um, the, uh, the question is actually, it's, it's National Cybersecurity Month, right? So we're asking all the consumers to stop, think, and connect. But every time you look at how consumers actually go through the web, it's just as you say, they click through because they really want to get to the thing. And I've actually had, to, on my previous life, to teach people about this, either at the uh, eighth grade level or at the senior citizen level. And the eighth graders had more facility, but it was often in um, how to get around the issues, right? They really wanted to figure out how to get to this place. Now we're seeing um, this issue that you just highlighted around Facebook um, user IDs leaking um, through uh, the browser um, address field itself, right? So there's this issue with masking. Um, to what extent should um, browser developers and um, the different institutions, this ecosystem that's represented ably in this room, be developing ways to more um, adroitly secure people's identity in browsers? Uh, to, you know, to what extent um, could, could Google be doing that? You've already moved um, to encrypted search in some places. Um, what are the technical barriers to that? What are the policy barriers to that in terms of the levers that government and advocacy can use? Can I, I'll, I'm going to take this one. I mean, I, I, um, you know, how many of the uh, eighth graders that you worked with knew, know what a uh, certificate authority is, right? So, and and in, in all of those screens that users see, they're confronted with those exact words, but none of them know what that means. That's a usability problem. If you're going to get them to stop, think, and click, right, you have to be able to get the usability to the point where um, th th when they're stopping and thinking, it's something that they can do something about, right? So, and that's where the problem is. Uh, um, Andy got to this at the last point, talking about some of the usability issues. I think that that's th the whole answer there, I mean, in terms of education around this, comes down to usability. Um, f for this kind of an issue, right? You can't just put up a screen that says, um, you know, here's the information about this certificate and expect that an eighth grader is going to be able to understand what to do with that, even one that is very well versed in how to use the internet, right? So um, I think we have to go back and think about how, how security usability works to get to that answer. So uh, we have actually a usability expert over there in the black leather jacket. Can you pass the mic to him? Uh, Sarah Jagelman, NIST. So this whole discussion is predicated on the assumption that users are going to look at the icon and then, you know, trust it because they've found it. Um, and then when something goes horribly, horribly wrong and they get a warning, there's also this assumption that they're going to do the right thing when they see this warning. And there have been studies over the past several years on this <laughs> where we've, you know, controlled, um, you know, we've done these rigorous scientific studies and we found that when users aren't explicitly primed to look for security indicators, Zero people look for the lock icon. Um, in, another, in one study just a couple years ago, when the lock icon was explicitly removed from a banking website uh, in the laboratory, it didn't prevent anyone from still logging in there. Uh, in one of my own studies where we looked at the SSL warnings, so, you know, so when everything's going right, people don't look at the indicators. But now when something's gone wrong, it's really not that much better because with the current SSL warnings, we found that around 90% of the time, people just click right through them. And the question is, are they really wrong to do so? Because most of the time when you see the SSL warning, it's usually, you know, not necessarily the wrong thing because, 
Um, often the sites screw up with the, you know, the common name field, for instance, or maybe it expired by one day. Now, sure, there's some risk in that, but really most of the time when users encounter this, it's sort of a false positive, so we become habituated into ignoring them. So there's a second part of that, which so, is... So what's the question? Well, I'm just hoping that, some, you know, that someone could speak to this because you know, I've, I'd argue that this is a much bigger problem than simply getting the indicator you know, to always correct the, uh, reflect the correct state. I'm going to try and answer this quickly. I think Andy had the right point about this. We need to move towards systems that are capable of taking the decision out of the user's hands. So if there's an STS message sent by a, per, a website like PayPal's that needs to be very secure, then you don't get the warning, it just fails. And, and you can't make it work if there isn't the right certificate. Go ahead. Um, so A, absolutely, you're correct. I agree entirely that we should not be asking users to do this. Um, and very quickly, we also have somewhat of a, a lemon market here in that many banking sites, um, they, will, they want their users to feel secure, but the users cannot tell the difference between apparent and actual security, which is why many sites have uh, put up warnings saying, even though this page isn't secure, you can log in you know, uh, in comfort because the form is, which is complete rubbish. Um, and yet, again, we, here we have the incentives. The sites only want their users to feel secure, and when they can't tell the difference, that's all they'll pay for. Uh, I think we have a couple of time for one or two more questions. The gentleman in the fourth row in the aisle. Right, one, one more for it. There we go. Thank you. I, I'm not a geek. I'm from a different industry. I'm from the cable industry. And we looked at a lot of these problems. Uh, and I'm with BBT, Beyond Broadband Technology, and we looked at this and said one of the obvious problems for us is the trusted authority, the CA. And we figured out a way of getting rid of the trusted authority, which goes directly to your point of if the two ends of the communication take responsibility, and that in the case of the bank, for instance, the bank and the user, and the encrypted information, the secure communications path, can only work if they both know who each other are, which is what, the way we've de designed our system, then if it's the wrong place, the secure communications path never, never establishes. So I, I, what's concerning me is we've got the smartest people about the internet, presumably, in this room, and nobody has talked at all or very little about anything other than trying to fix trusted authorities. That's why not because get this rid event of them? is about trusted authorities. Right? Well, but so why not get rid of them is the point. Okay. Well, your scheme requires a quadratic increase in the number of, uh, of pairings. Each user in each uh, site they go to would have to have a trusted link. Whereas with certificate authorities, you know, we can have you know, N certificates for N websites. Whereas if every pair of people has to have a link, we can't deal with the scale. But it's right. not working. And then last question, the gentleman in the second row. Hi. Two questions. Oh, One okay. is, is there enough publicly accessible HCI research being done that you know, people can look at and interact, you know, inter exchange with each other and sort of learn what works, what doesn't work for users? When do you shift the responsibility to the user? When do you have to eat that as the developer? And the second thing is, given the fact that you know, this type of vulnerability um, has existed, at least, you know, hypothetically for quite a while, and there's potentially huge payoff to the bad guy who gets in first and gets it right, aren't we kind of already hosed? And if not, why really hasn't that happened? And are there ways that the endpoints can say, you know, determine that, you know, these people trying to log in really aren't, you know, they're coming from some, some source that isn't, you know, shouldn't be trusted, and therefore, you know, you, you can find out what the failure point is in some other way. Oh, does anyone want to take it? Sure. Uh, so, do I, is there enough, um, you know, usability research? Maybe not enough. There, I mean, there's actually dedicated conferences and forums for it now, whereas it used to be the odd uh, computer security paper you'd see. You know, 10 years ago, we had, you know, why Johnny can't encrypt, and now we have whole conferences dedicated uh, to security and usability. Um, uh, so I think that that's, you know, substantial progress there. As to why we haven't seen massive attacks in this area, um, I forget who pointed it out, but it was that traditionally, you know, for 
for one, fishing was really easy, so you didn't have to compromise these other bits, bits of the ecosystem. Uh, you could fish users. As that's gotten less effective, or as malware has gotten more effective, you know, the attackers go where the money is, uh, and they're looking for the easy score, right, whatever's cheaper. So, so we can expect them to move to whatever parts of the ecosystem are the least secure and give them the biggest return. Uh, and we currently see where that trend is going. And eventually, as some of that dries up, as platforms get better, uh, and so on, then I think we'll see attacks in some of these other areas. I can't predict wh when. Anyone else? No. Right We'd like to th thank our panelists and uh, thank Andrew for his, uh, uh, for his keynote. And uh, uh, on behalf of the Center for Information Technology at Princeton, I'd also like to thank our uh, hosts and co-sponsors here at the New America Foundation. Um, Clearly, we have our work cut out for us on this topic. Um, I'd like to think that uh, Andrew is not right when he says this is the high water mark of geekiness in Washington. Uh, clearly, we geeks can continue to show up here and do better. And uh, hopefully, the uh, level of geeky water is continuing to rise and will continue to rise uh, at future events. Thanks, everybody.